want to welcome you to our 11.30 a.m. Wednesday luncheon Bible study. Uh, we still call it that, even though COVID still has us under some restrictions. We're not able to meet yet uh, for lunching. Uh, not able to do that spacing properly. But I still want to meet with you during your lunch hour and teach you, if you don't mind. We are currently studying uh, a lesson, a series of lessons called the Foundation Doctrines of the Holy Spirit that Jesus taught before his crucifixion, death and burial, and afterwards in the post-resurrection appearances of 40 days. Uh, he taught on this subject matter because they're the foundational doctrines of the church age, of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm, I've got to leave you guys, but... It's to your advantage that I go, this is in John 16, because if I don't come, the Holy Spirit will not come. And, uh, of course, that's the next order in the plan of God dispensationally. Uh, that would be the church age. And so these were the foundation. There would be a transitional period uh, in the book of Acts is the transitional period of moving out of the old covenant into the new covenant, out of the, the priest nation of Israel into the church, the divine agency of Israel has now become the divine agency is now the church, the custodians of the word of God. Those, those 10 transitional great things that had to be done are done uh, over the period of the book of Acts. And so the Holy Spirit would come at Pentecost, the church age would begin, and the transitional period that's discussed in the book of Acts would, would transpire. We're looking at those those transitional, uh, we're looking at those foundational doctrines on the just the ministry of the Holy Spirit that Jesus taught. And he taught seven of them that I want to talk about uh, in John 14, 15, and 16 at the Last Supper. So that would be beneficial to us. John 14, 15, and 16 will, will cover these seven major doctrines on the Holy Spirit for the church age. Um, Acts 1 two, three, would cover that beginning of that transitional period. Uh, we learned uh, from our last study uh, that is important to, day, to today's lesson. It comes from the Philip section. There was a Peter section that led to a Thomas section that led to, from chapter 13 into 14, that led to a Philip section. It is in the Philip section that our our, our lesson comes from John 14, 16, 17, and 18 verses. And so that's going to be important. If you recall from the last lesson I gave you, that in the Philip section, I listed in the Peter section and the Thomas section and the Philip section that would take you back to 1336 down into uh, the 14th chapter 21 th that would cover those sections. Uh, I showed you that when we got to Philip's section, which was John 14, 8 through 21, there were seven doctrines that I could teach from. Uh, over the whole period, that would be Philip's questions, Thomas questions, and the Philip questions, I listed 14 doctrines that I would teach my church and have, and we'll do it again. But one of the seven doctrines in the Philip section that I could teach from, I will teach one of them, and that is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So after a word of prayer, I'm going to come back and we're going to discuss John 14, verses 16, 17, and 18 in regard to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I must go, he must come. When he comes, he will do these things. One of the things he would do would be to indwell, indwell. And so we'll talk about that today from this section. And he will indwell permanently. You will, you will find the word, he will indwell forever. So let's have a word of prayer. Remember the Bible, spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude types or sins of the tongue or overt sins. 
What do I do? What do I do with, how do I get out of carnality and back into spirituality of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit who lives inside my body forever? Uh, forever would take in the idea of the rapture. We know that forever you're, you may die. But the rapture takes you forever because in the rapture you will, you will not die. You'll be, you'll be transfigured. But anyhow, just telling you, he's got the word forever in, in the Jesus is going to say forever. And that is true, forever. Well, so how do I get out of carnality into spirituality? Here's how you do it. First John 1, 9, it's written to Christians. If we confess our sins, we, Christians, the book was written, to, First John was written to Christians. If we confess our sins, you don't have to do that to be saved, but you have to do it to be spiritual. What you have to do to be saved is believe that Jesus took care of all of your sins on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, gave you eternal life. That package called the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection is the gospel, Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes. When you believe that, you are removed from Adamic sin, 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin, judicial charges of Adamic sin. Okay, this is not what 1 John 1, 9 is talking about. It says if we confess our sins, you don't confess your sins to be saved. You confess that Christ is your Savior to be saved, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. But in 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin as personal, this could be mental attitudes, sins of the tongue, overt sins. The Bible tells you what sin is. You don't make it up. You don't make up your own list, nor does the church. The Bible makes up your list of what sins are. These are just three categories. You can search for them. And when you identify it in your life, you confess it. And he cleanses. It takes you back to the, it takes the believer back to the cross, not for salvation, but for spirituality. When you confess your sins, you are cleansed. Your flesh is cleansed. Your soul is cleansed from personal sin for, because of the work of Christ on the cross. I keep pointing over there. There's not a cross there. I'm just making a point. Now, so let's have a word of prayer. You confess your sins. I have confessed mine. I will, if I have any, I'll make sure I do it before I begin teaching so the Holy Spirit can teach me, teach through me the truth of the word of God that you can learn that truth from me and it can, re, it can establish your soul. It, Jesus said, it, it, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free from the cosmic system of lies. John 8, 32. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today. For all that your love and grace has provided us, thank you for your mercy. It's new every morning and fresh in our souls every day. And every day, Father, you show, show us great mercy. I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God in regard to the indwelling Holy Spirit in our life. It is the dynamics of the Christian life in the church age under the new covenant. We've made this prayer in the name of Jesus. We are thankful for that name, Father, in our life that makes our life so important in the plan of God. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, I want to look at four aspects. I, these are the, for me, there are key aspects of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a foundation doctrine taught by Jesus in preparation for the church age. <clears throat> My first point is I want us to examine, and I'm going to outline John 14, 16, 17, 18. Now, I'm going to read them to you. <clears throat> then I'm going to show you the outline uh, of the Godhead, the outline of the Godhead. Anytime you find the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit engaged in anything in the Bible, it is a big, big deal. And they're involved in it a lot especially in the church age, but even in the Old Covenant. So pay attention and watch for the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Some people call it Trinity. That's fine. That's a Latin word. I will ask the Father, verse 16, John 14. I will ask the Father, that's God the Father, and that the Son is asking. 
I will, this, the, God the Son is asking, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, another helper. The word another is alas, means another the same kind, another member of the Godhead. God, God, the, God the Son is speaking on behalf of God the Father about God the Holy Spirit. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, because I'm leaving, John 16, I'm leaving, that that, and here's the divine purpose, that he may be with you forever. Verse 16, verse 17. That is the, the helper, that is the spirit of truth. That's a title given to him in the church age. That's a title given to the helper in the church age. That is the spirit of truth, whom the spirit of truth, whom the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive as the spirit of truth because it does not behold him or know him. But you, that's second person plural, that's sue in the Greek language, that's second person plural. You all, believers, 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 that you know him because he abides with you now and will be in you soon. That's the idea. He now, in the, in the old covenant, <clears throat> he abides with you. But in the new covenant, when I leave and the Holy Spirit comes, you're in a new covenant. In the church age, he will, ab he will abide in you. Abide. Verse 18. I will not leave you an orphan. I will come to you. Now notice how, how this, these three verses, notice how they begin and how they close. I will. Then it turns to he will. And then it, the father. Then the father will. I the son will. And then the father will. And then the Holy Spirit will. And then he comes back. I will not leave you an orphan. I will come to you. Notice, notice the three I wills. <clears throat> the son's part. The son's part is to ask the father. At the right time, he is to ask the Father to send the Comforter, and the Comforter will be sent. The Comforter has a responsibility, and that's a discussion. He will abide with you now and will abide with you in the, soon. He will be in you. I will not leave you an orphan. I will come to you. That's really important. Okay? Now, on your, if you have a paper, if not, you know, if you don't have our notes that you could pull down from our web, if you didn't pull them now, you can pull them later, but get a pencil, get a, get a Bible. Come on, people. Now I want to show it to you. Look at verse 16. We have God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. The Son's part, I will ask the Father. That word ask, in the Greek language, eroteo, eroteo, is a word that's used for a, a, a prayer of petition. It's a future act of indicative. I will at some point in the future, I will, I will, I will. When I get back to heaven, there's a 10-day 10 10 period, and I will ask the Father in that period, and he will send the Holy Spirit, and he will 10 days later at Pentecost. I will ask the Father, God the Father, Here's his role. He will give you another comforter. He will give is diddle me. It's a future active indicative, third person plural. The father waits for the son's request. Jesus will make that request, seated at the right hand of God the Father. He will speak, and when he does, it will be from an authority level. The word you, he will give you another comforter, is second, it's a, it's a plural. It's the word su, and it's a plural, meaning you all, and he will give you all. Then we have God the Spirit. He, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of truth, that he may be with you, same, same idea with you, plural, forever. 
the, the word may be is imi. It's not future. It's present active subjunctive. The word that's hina. And it reflects the plan of God. When Jesus gets back to heaven, sits on the throne, he will ask the Father. That's not many days from now that he talked about in Acts before he left. I will ask the Father, I will make a petition, I will make a request to the Father that it's time to send, it's, we're ready to begin a new dispensation, we're beginning to the, establish the new covenant, and the Father will give, he will give, he will send in my name the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has a ministry. One is that he will be with you forever. He will be with you, that's part of the divine plan of God. You will see it in chapter 14, 15, and 16. You need to know that. With you is meta plus the genitive of accompaniment. He will accompany you forever. He will be, he will be your partner. He will accompany you forever. Then in verse 17, it is the, God, the Holy Spirit's ministry. That is whom, that is the spirit of truth, whom, whom, and he divides the world into believers and unbelievers. He says the world cannot receive the spirit of truth because, Hote, because it, the world, it, the world, it. You know who controls the world, it? 1 John 5, 19, the God of this world, Satan. He operates, this is his operating sphere of humanity. The world, uh, because it does not see him, see he's talking about the world of people, unbelievers, cannot see him or know him, present active indicative tenses, and does not know him, but you... You who have been born again out of the world are now part of the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of the world, not, not the kingdoms of the world, but the kingdom of God. You know, see, a believer, you know him because, Hote, because he abides mental, remains present active indicative third person singular, with power plus the logative place beside you now and will be in the future middle indicative and will soon be in you in plus the locative of a dwelling place, in you. All of that's really important. I gave you all the dynamics of the Greek language that's so important. The present tense of he abides with you. He abides with you and will be in you and switched it from a present tense to a future tense. That's powerful. And when will that be? Well, John 16 will tell you. Somewhere down around verse 7. Here's John 14, 18. Comes back to God the Son. It now comes back to God the Son. And he offers a promise, a promise to his disciples in the period between his ascension and Pentecost. There's a 10-day period. After his resurrection, his re resurrection is first fruits. You go 50 days to Pentecost. That's a timetable. It's a biblical timetable for the end of the Jewish age and the beginning of the church age. That's a timetable. He's going to ascend back with 10 days to go. When that 10 days is up, Pentecost comes and the Holy Spirit comes with it. Uh, with, with that advent comes the church age, the new covenant, etc. No, oh, my goodness. You need to get into the word of God and stop listening to foolishness of people. So he makes a promise. 
Watch this in verse 8. I will not leave you an orphan. An orphan. Now, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to the you. He's talking to the world. He's not talking to the world. The world, illegitimate. They're illegitimate children, Hebrews 13. They're illegitimate children. They're, they're born in Adam. Not born in Christ. Born again. He's talking to the you. He's talking to the you. Well, I will not leave you. Is he not talking to you? As orphans, I will come to you. Mm -mm -mm. I will not leave you. I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you. That's a future active indicative. I will not leave you as orphans. I will Watch this. I will come to you. That's a, that's a present active indicative. I'm going to leave you, but I will not leave you orphans. And I'm going to come to you. Now, this is going to be, look, this, he's going to come back to them during the 40 years of post-resurrection appearance. He's going to leave them again. He says, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to come back. And this, I'm going to leave you again. That 10-day period is discussed in John 20. Let's go over there a moment. That 10-day period where they will be orphans, Jesus discussed to them, discussed with them in John, the 20th chapter. Verse 22. Now, Jesus is in his post-resurrection appearances, like verse 19. And when therefore it was evening on the first day, the, day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, this is of his resurrection, and where the disciples were in fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood and said, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. You know how they recognized him? Well, there's your test. He showed them both his hands and his feet, his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced. Jesus therefore said to them again, again, peace be with you. What was it he said again? Peace be with you. You know, you know what their problem is? They're not confident that he's been raised from the dead. And so he's appearing. Other people said they've seen him. Other people said they've seen him. Not everybody's on the same page, Thomas. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now watch this. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. The only time this is ever going to occur in your life is if you'd have been a disciple during those 10 days. They've got the Lord. They'll, they'll wait for another comforter who will take his place. In the meantime, there's a period when they're orphans. 10 days. My, my, my. And then Thomas, he's not there. The first, originally, and then he gets into a discussion with him, and Jesus shows him. Okay, that kind of answers that ten-day period. Okay, they're not going to be indwelt until Pentecost. Point number two. That was John 20, 22. I know you didn't write it down. Now you're curious. John, oh my God. <clears throat> Point number two, God gives every church age believer, I call it a cab, C-A-B. God gives every church age believer eight works of the Holy Spirit at the moment of grace salvation by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's because we're in the church age of the new covenant. In John 14, 16 through 18, we're told that he in, we're indwelt 
by the Holy Spirit forever. So I wrote the eight works of the Holy Spirit that every believer gets at the moment of salvation. The moment you believe Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, the moment you believe it as the source of your salvation, you are saved and the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside your body. It's called the indwelling of the third member of the Godhead and he's there forever. And it's not anything you do, it's what you believe. I believe that Jesus died for my sins to remove the sin package of Adam from my life. For, where, wherefore by one man, Romans 5, 12. Wherefore for by one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death, spiritual death spread to all mankind for all have sinned. In Adam, all have sinned. All are sinners in Adam. Oh, my goodness. And so here, here are eight you can study. My study is one of the eight. Adoption. See, the moment you're saved, the Holy Spirit adopts you eternally because he's there forever, eternally into the family of God. You're a member of the royal family of God, 1 Peter 2. I gave you Romans 8, 15 through 17, Galatians 4, 4 through 7. You are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ and into the church, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and Galatians 3, 24 and you should... To, Galatians 3.27, you should read them. Indwelling, which is our subject matter. Regeneration. Titus 3.5-7. through 7, John 7.37-39 7, through 39 should be read. Sanctification. Sanctification. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Romans 15.16. Sealed unto the day of the redemption. Ephesians 1.13 and 14. And you should add 430. That's a bonus. And 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22. You have spiritual life. Romans 8, 9 through 11. Ephesians 2, 5. 2 Corinthians 2, 16. You have a spiritual gift. It is your identity in the body of Christ for service. Romans 12, 6. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 through 13. You see, not only are you indwelt by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation, that's a gift, but you have seven other works of the Holy Spirit that are just as important, just as important. Adoption, baptism, indwelling, regeneration, sanctification, seals, sealing in earnest, the spiritual life and spiritual gifts. You should really know these eight and how, they, and how they affect your personal spiritual life. I'm dwelling, I am dealing with the indwelling, point number three. The Holy Spirit permanently, forever, right, permanently indwells every church aid believer's body from salvation to dying grace or rapture. John 14, 16 through 18, Romans 8, 9 through 11, 1 Thessalonians 4, 4, 13 through 18, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, add to your list. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. That's dying grace. Every church age believer becomes a member of the universal church at the moment of grace salvation. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know? That's a way that Paul says you have been taught. How come you don't know this? You have been taught. I taught you this. How is it that you don't know that? That's what he's saying. Do you not know, oida, perfect tense? You've been taught, how come you don't know it? You've been taught it, how come you don't know it? Or how come you've been taught it and knew it and forsook it for some other goofiness? Do you not know that, here's what they should know, that you are the temple, the naos, the place, a holies of holies in the main temple, 
the place where the blood was used for relationship with God through Christ. No man comes to the Father except through me. That was illustrated in the temple. You are the temple, the naos of God. That's the first that, and there's a second that that goes with that. You are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Oikato dwells, takes up residence, makes a home inside your body. The word you is plural. Every church age believer. Then he says, if any man destroys, that's a first class condition. If this is true, if the protestant is true, the apotheosis is true. If any man destroys the temple of God, here's what's true as well. God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. He's used that word that again. You see that? He's used that word. The word that has been used three times. Did you see that? Hey, I'm just pointing it out. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. He's talking about the universal church, every church age believer. This is true of every church age believer. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. The worship of God, here's a, here's a verse you should put down. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Actually, you should put 18 down. I put it up there under indwelling. Make sure you put it down here again and make sure you read it. The way you should read this verse to get what he's saying, let's just look at that a moment. 2 Corinthians 6. The way you should read it is go to, the, go to verse 20 and read back. Six twenty. That's the last verse. For you have been bought with a price, that's, that's Christ on the cross, being buried and raised from the dead. You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Every Christian's body, because it is the, the residence of the indwelling Holy Spirit, third member of the Godhead, through the entire church age. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Verse 19, do you not know, you, you should because you've been properly taught, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you indwelling, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. So you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now look at verse 18. It tells you one of the problems. Flee immorality, that's fornication, that's sexual perversion of any kind. Every other sin that a man commits outside the body, every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral, the fornicator, the perverter sins against his own body. Now, who is he talking to? Not the world. That's normal standard for the world. That's abnormal for the church. And the reason the reason is that your body, you're to glorify God with your body. Your body is not your own. It's been bought at Calvary when you got saved. Oh, I bet you're mad now, aren't you? <laughs> oh, boy. Teach that to your children. Your teenagers who are dating and off to college into sexual perversion. Set them down and teach this. You need to set them down and teach it when they're six and seven. 
time there's the time they're 17 and 27, they're full of the world and foolishness and perversion. And they're and if they are a believer, they're gonna get disciplined to the hilt. You know why? Because your body in conversion, in salvation, your body becomes a temple of God. Listen to me now. It is the place of worship. Your body is the place of worship. It is the holies of holies where the blood of Christ is required to have a relationship with God. No man can come to the Father except through me. Your body is the place of worship. The worship of God takes place in the spiritual believer's body. And when he joins other believers for worship of God through Christ, it's called the church. Gosh. If the only place you can worship is in church with other people and you can't worship God apart from them, but use your body for fornication, you need to come awake. The church has been corrupted from the inside out because of the outside in. Nah, I know. I know you think this is, I need to come up to modern times, don't I? Huh? I need to get real. I need to get into the 21st century. Listen, I'm in the 21st century. Jesus Christ is in the 21st century. This is not an old book, and he's not an old guy. And let me tell you, you're going to face him one day, one way or the other. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess if you're an unbeliever. And if you're a believer, listen, the day of reckoning is coming, and it's coming sooner than you think. If you're a believer in Christ, you're going to be disciplined. And he's going to bring discipline on your body because your body is misused. Gee. Listen, I'm not, I'm not just picking on them, but Paul did, because he had a problem in the Corinthian church. They didn't come to church to worship. They came to church as a whorehouse, not a place of worship. They had to clean it up. He did it by teaching grace, not judgment. You need to clean your life up. You need to come to church to worship. Listen, if you won't worship in your body away from church, you can't do it in church. Oh, my goodness. The church has become so corrupted, there's no way we can ever pull this back unless the church gets clean. This is what cleansing is about. That's why you confess your sins. Do you back to this life of the, the spiritual life of the Holy Spirit inside you? The devil can't offer you anything in this world that is more exciting than the life of a spiritual believer than the ministry of the Holy Spirit working the Word of God out of their life. There is absolutely nothing that can compare with it. This COVID issue that we're in in America is a, should be a spiritual awakening in the church. You need to come home, clean up your life. Get your, get the, get your temple back into spiritual shape. Come back to the church and be part of the movement of Christ in this world. He's coming again, and judgment is going to be terrible. The tribulation is going to be the most unbelievable. This, this COVID crisis is nothing. It is absolutely nothing. It's not killing anybody compared to what the tribulation will kill. The war of Armageddon. You know, there's never a war like that. You think, you think about you're in tough times now? Listen, you should be wanting to get your friends into the, into, into the kingdom.
I don't know. It's time to wake up. I can tell you that. The church of Jesus Christ has got to wake up. Parents have got children that are living in this kind of condition. They need to send, a, send an alert, an SOS. Everybody's wearing a mask, afraid of a COVID, and living in carnality, living in sin, and, and think that that's, that's good, and wearing a mask is good. My, my. My, my. How can you wear a mask and live in sin and not think that that the mask is good and the sin is, is good. Man, how can you do that? that? That's not any apple and oranges. I mean, come on. Point number four, the indwelling Holy Spirit becomes the spiritual fountain of God's living water for the abundant life. There's so many Christians that they, they, they never touch the abundant life. You have John 10.10. 10. Jesus promised you an abundant life. What would that be? It'd be spiritual. It wouldn't be carnal. He's got an abundant life for you. And listen how it's described. The spiritual fountain of God's living water for living the abundant life. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman in John, the fourth chapter, verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, this singular, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You know what's interesting about this is the word if. It's a second class condition in the Greek language. See, not all ifs are ifs in the Greek language. They're all ifs, but they don't all mean the same. See, in the English, you say if, you don't have it. In the Greek language, you have four, you have four different views of the word if. The second class means, in this case, Something that is assumed to be false, something that's assumed to be true that's false, in the protasis is going to be false in the apotasis. Watch. If you knew the gift of God, you don't. And who it is who says to you, you don't. Give me a drink. You would have asked him, but you didn't. And he would have given you living water. You didn't get it. Living water. That living water that comes to your life in time will be part of your eternal abode, the eternal water in heaven. And it is the abundant life. The water idea. In John 4.14, he says, whoever, he uses hoss as a relative pronoun, talking about whoever has positive volition towards God who, uh, about drinking the living water. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. Isn't that interesting? The world has nothing. Coca-Cola, Pepsi. And the list goes on. All the different varieties of water leave you thirsty. But the water that Jesus gives you, the living water, will take the thirst of the world away from you when you live in the power of the Spirit. When you live in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the taste for the things of the world disappear. Never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. When do I get that? Now. 
forever. John 10.10, 10, the abundant life. In closing, Jesus speaks to his disciples and to us in a footnote. John 7, 38 and 39. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost beings will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive for the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. As, listen, glorified, resurrection of body, ascending back and seated at the right hand of God the Father. And so he is. He's going to send the Holy Spirit. And every person that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ has the well of living water in them. And you need to tap into that living water that takes away the thirst from the things of the world and fulfills the things of God in your life while you're on earth. The indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit is what we're talking about today. That's where the living water flows from. Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the internet. We thank you, Father, for your marvelous love and grace and mercy and nurturing. You're a wonderful God. You're a wonderful God. And what a wonderful Savior that would give his life for riffraff like me. That I might tell the other riffraff of the world, there's a place for you in Christ of great service. Don't sell yourself short. Come to Christ. Believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and find the fountain of living water flow through your life to others who are thirsty, going to the world for a drink, and their soul going to hell. Could get a drink of water from your well like the woman, the Samaritan woman did of Jesus in the end. We're the fountain of living water for the world who are thirsty to drink from it. If we will just invite them, as Jesus did the Samaritan woman in John 4, in Jesus' name, amen.